The Book of Mormon contains the account of a man named Nehor. It's easy to understand why Mormon, in abridging a thousand years of Nephite records, thought it important to include something about this man and the enduring influence of his doctrine. Mormon was seeking to warn us, knowing that this philosophy would surface again in our day. Nehor appeared on the scene about 90 years before the birth of Christ. He taught that all mankind should be saved at the last day, for the Lord had created all men and had also redeemed all men, and in the end all men should have eternal life. About 15 years later, Korahor came among the Nephites, preaching and amplifying the doctrine of Nehor. The Book of Mormon records that he was anti-Christ, for he began to preach unto the people against the prophecies concerning the coming of Christ. Korahor's preaching was to the effect that there could be no atonement made for the sins of men, but every man fared in this life according to the management of the creature. Therefore every man prospered according to his genius, and that every man conquered according to his strength, and whatsoever a man did was no crime. These false prophets and their followers did not believe in the repentance of their sins. As in the days of Nehor and Korahor, we live in a time not long before the advent of Jesus Christ, in our case, the time of preparation for His second coming. And similarly, the message of repentance is often not welcomed. Some profess that if there is a God, He makes no real demands upon us. Others maintain that a loving God forgives all sin based on simple confession. Or if there actually is a punishment for sin, God will beat us with a few stripes and at last we shall be saved in the kingdom of God. Others, with Korahor, deny the very existence of Christ and any such thing as sin. Their doctrine is that values, standards, and even truth are all relative. Thus, whatever one feels is right for him or her cannot be judged by others to be wrong or sinful. On the surface, such philosophies seem appealing because they give us license to indulge any appetite or desire without concern for consequences. By using the teachings of Nehor and Korahor, we can rationalize and justify anything. When prophets come crying repentance, it throws cold water on the party. But in reality, the prophetic call should be received with joy. Without repentance, there is no real progress or improvement in life. Pretending there is no sin does not lessen its burden and pain. Suffering for sin does not by itself change anything for the better. Only repentance leads to the sunlit uplands of a better life. And of course, only through repentance do we gain access to the atoning grace of Jesus Christ and salvation. Repentance is a divine gift, and there should be a smile on our faces when we speak of it. See, I'm smiling. <laughs> It points us to freedom and confidence and peace. Rather than interrupting the celebration, the gift of repentance is the cause for true celebration. Repentance exists as an option only because of the Atonement of Jesus Christ. It is His infinite sacrifice that bringeth about means unto men that they may have faith unto repentance. Repentance is the necessary condition and the grace of Christ is the power by which mercy can satisfy the demands of justice. Our witness is this. We know that justification, or forgiveness of sins, through the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is just and true. And we know also that sanctification, or purification from the effects of sin, through the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is just and true to all those who love and serve God with all their mights, minds, and strength. Repentance is an expansive subject, but today I'd like to mention just five aspects of this fundamental gospel principle that I hope will be helpful. First, the invitation to repent is an expression of love. 
When the Savior began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, it was a message of love, inviting all who would to qualify to join him and enjoy the words of eternal life in this world and eternal life itself in the world to come. If we do not invite others to change or if we do not demand repentance of ourselves, we fail in a fundamental duty we owe to one another and to ourselves. A permissive parent, an indulgent friend, a fearful church leader are in reality more concerned about themselves than the welfare and happiness of those they could help. Yes, the call to repentance is at times regarded as intolerant or offensive and may even be resented. But guided by the Spirit, it is in reality an act of genuine caring. Second, repentance means striving to change. It would mock the Savior's suffering in the Garden of Gethsemane and on the cross for us to expect that he should transform us into angelic beings with no real effort on our part. Rather, we seek his grace to complement and reward our most diligent efforts. Perhaps as much as for mercy, we should pray for time and opportunity to work and strive and overcome. Surely the Lord smiles upon one who desires to come to judgment worthily, who resolutely labors day by day to replace weakness with strength. Real repentance, real change may require repeated attempts, but there is something refining and holy in such striving. Divine forgiveness and healing flow quite naturally to such a soul. For indeed, virtue loveth virtue, light cleaveth unto light, and mercy hath compassion on mercy, and claimeth her own. With repentance we can steadily improve in our capacity to live the celestial law. For we recognize that he who is not able to abide the law of a celestial kingdom cannot abide a celestial glory.